So my name is Rashad Raymond. Um, I'm a student of philosophy, German and Italian at Western University in London. Um, some of my interests... Can we cheer? <laughs> you can cheer, yes. <laughs> um, uh, some of my interests, so one of, the, one of the interests that I have naturally is the question of the meaning of life, um, but also things like philosophy of religion, mind, philosophical theology, those are more of the areas that I tend to look at, but uh, naturally enough, derivative from that is questions of meaning. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I feel very privileged and honored, and uh, so let's get into it. So the title of this talk is The Ontic Foundation of Hope, Kant's Question, and Kiefer's Answer to Sartre. Now, two of these, now, the name is Sartre, right? If you say Sartre, you get in trouble for doing too French, and then if you say Sartre, then you get even more trouble for the Americans, so I'm gonna go with, like, Sartre, and then that'll, that'll, maybe that'll be okay, I'll get away with, like, you know, the Canadian middle. So, there's obviously, uh, there's three names, two of which we're relatively familiar with. When you study rationalism and empiricism, you come across Kant, or you know his famous Critique der Rang und Vernunft, the Critique of Pure Reason, you come across uh, Kant, um, as well as Sartre, when you do continental philosophy or existentialism, uh, that's typically where you come across him. Um, and any general you know, philosophical education, chances are you know about him. Um, one thing that I'm particularly excited about, though, is the introduction of a German philosopher, Josef Pieper, into the discussion. And what I'm going to describe, not necessarily as the view that he espouses in his published works, but um, a certain kind of idea that I think is generated in his work, which I think uh, might actually have bearing on the question of the meaning of life. So there's no, I don't think, explicit you know, connection between the two, but I'll get into what it means. Okay, so there's definitely many formulations of the question, uh, many distinctions to be made and so forth. Here are just a few of them. Uh, you know, so what is the meaning of life? What gives life meaning? Why well, care about meaning? Uh, you know, what is meaning? What constitutes? You know, and so on and so forth. So I think that there's definitely many ways in which we could approach the, the subject in general. Um, and I think we need to be aware of uh, the answer that we give might only be in response to a particular kind of question. The goal is to figure out which one's the right question, or maybe the wrong. So why does it matter? As uh, another presenter uh, mentioned, the, the book called The Myth of Sisyphus, um, in which you know, Sisyphus is you know, condemned by the gods to you know, roll this, this rock up the hill for all eternity. And uh, the question is, well, what meaning is there in that? Um, at the beginning of the book, Albert Camus poses a, a very interesting, and this is actually the first sentence of the book. He says, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. So I think basically behind the question of meaning in general, the I mean, behind you know, all of the ways in which we formulate the question, the basic idea is why not in the end suicide? I mean, realistically speaking, why, why continue our existence any longer than it's gone on? Um, you know, if we did actually go through with it, what, you know, what kind of reason would you give to say that actually you shouldn't have done that or something like that? So I think that the, the basic idea is why not suicide? So I mean, that just kind of exemplifies as well the seriousness of the question. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. So first I'm gonna do some really brief biographies just to kind of get an idea of, of, of who we're talking about. And then I'm gonna introduce the problem of meaning. I'll mention some ambiguities, misuses, and distinctions. Uh, we'll move on to exploring um, a theory of meaning by Jean-Paul Sartre, who, well, that goes for my Canadian pronunciation, but you know, Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, it will go with um, explaining his theory of meaning, that essentially we are the constructors of the meaning of life. And then I'll eventually pose a different question by Immanuel Kant, and then eventually you'll set Pieper, and then how he understands it. Um, we'll do a conclusion, and then maybe some Q&A, time permitting. So that will be the sort of methodology which, with, uh, which, with which I'm pleased. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time here, but it's a good idea of getting a, an idea of what we're talking about. Immanuel Kant, born in Königsberg. He's got the three famous critiques, the critique of pure reason, practical reason, and judgment. Uh, and he's also known for his absolutist ethics, which is formulated in his book, The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals. Um, and he typically comes up, like I said, in discussions of uh, rationalism and empiricism, um, or even debates um, about the nature of reality, you know, making the distinction between appearance and reality. He calls it the noumenal and phenomenal distinction. So that typically comes up there. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, he was a French existentialist, novelist. Uh, he was a, also an essay writer, notably. 
and uh, he was a post-World War II reactionary. Now, I think it's important as well, maybe it's just a general comment, is to situate these thinkers within their historical contexts. And one of the reasons why I suggest that is not to suggest you know, a historicist attitude, which says that the truth of a proposition is only, you know, it's only true in given circumstances or different historical periods. You know, it's true of one historical period, but not in another. I think the basic idea that I'm trying to get at is that we need to understand why, in general, these people are arguing as they are or writing as they are. Um, there seems to be sometimes you know, a different kind of uh, purpose with which you know, they're doing these things. Um, and so Josef Kiefer is a German philosopher. He's a neo-Thomist and a Western traditionalist. I'm not sure if Western traditionalism is my invention. I don't know what the term is. Probably not. But uh, uh, the basic idea that I'm trying to capture, though, uh, is not anything dogmatic. Uh, on his part, but basically his idea that the, in, within the Western tradition, going from you know, Plato, Socrates, even the pre-Socratics, and onwards to people like uh, Aquinas and Augustine, we can find these sort of like nuggets of truth which really kind of hit at the core uh, um, subject matters with which we're dealing. So I think in that sense, uh, I would call him a bit of a Western traditionalist. Although he doesn't by any means um, uh, depreciate the Eastern tradition. I think that's his point. Okay, so here's a very simple definition of meaning, why something matters. I don't know if it's too helpful, but nevertheless, that's one that you could give. I mean, sort of uh, this, the reason for which something we might say actually matters. Um, now, the problem is, of course, this is going to be indexed to a particular language. In our case, it's going to be English. But there are a little bit of ambiguities with this. Um, you know, when we say a meaningful song, or, uh, you know, more poetically, perhaps maybe only on TLC or something, but, you know, we were meant for one another. I'm not sure. Um, but one thing that definitely arises is I'm not sure if we're always talking about the same thing in each case. Now, of course, we can use the word equivocally, we can use them in two different senses. But I think what we need to understand is that there is sometimes an ambiguity when we ask the question, what is the meaning of life, right? Because, you know, you sort of seem to be asking different questions at, at once, and also what I mean by that, there are going to be different distinctions. Um, and then sometimes we misuse it, uh, you know, my job gives my life meaning. I mean, sure, I mean, you might say that, you know, to some extent, you know, it's meaningful work. But at the same time, we have to realize that that might not actually be what we mean by why not suicide, like something as serious as that, or to that extent. So I think in that sense, we need to be careful of ambiguities and misuses. Now, I think this probably is going to be one of the most important uh, parts of the presentation in terms of those who want to preserve the discussion of meaning in general. Now, what I mean by that is there's many distinctions to be made. So, for example, realism and anti-realism, whether or not you do think that there's meaning or you don't. Uh, subjective and objective, so is it the case that I subjectively make the meaning of my life? Or is it the case that there's an ob objective meaning which sort of confers meaning on my life independent of what I do? Um, and then we get distinctions between you know, meaning, significance, and purpose. Um, some people might think that there's some reducibility relations that are going on. That you know, maybe we're really talking about you know, the same thing here, maybe they're just synonyms, right? But uh, meaning has to do with you know, why something matters. Purpose might have to do something with uh, the end for which something is made, coming from you know, uh, the Greek telos, purpose. Um, and then, as I said, uh, reductionism and anti-reductionism. Uh, it might be the case that some people think that really what we're talking about when we're talking about meaning is really reducible to something else, right? Maybe it's reducible to you know, the characteristic things that we do, or maybe it's reducible to the projects with which we you know, engage with the world, something like that. So, I mean, there's definitely distinctions to be made, and sometimes these get a little bit blurred uh, when we go to talk about you know, the whole question of meaning. Now, let me share this next. Um, and so, I mean, when we ask ourselves, you know, what kind of theories of meaning are there? How are we to formulate one? Well, here's one attempt by Jean-Paul Sartre. So this is the basic idea, and the, the idea comes from his book, Existentialism is a Humanism. Um, and I've given the bare bones of the idea, and I think that it's exegetically defensible. I think that this is something that he actually claimed. Now, while he didn't construe deductively, I did. And so we can go through it as follows. Now, in assessing an argument, though, just to be very clear about how we're supposed to be looking at this, if you grant that the premises are true in a deductive argument, what follows, logically, is the conclusion. So the only way in which you can deny the conclusion, right, you know, the therefore, is if you deny one of the premises, and so you need justification for that. So here's the argument. If God does not exist, there is no objective meaning. Um, at the very beginning of existentialism as a humanism, sorry, it says explicitly, everything that I'm about to describe are the consequences of basically atheistic existentialism. He kind of presupposes that and just kind of rests it there. 
he makes the presupposition that God doesn't exist. He doesn't think that you know we need ex, you know justification for this claim. He takes it as fairly axiomatic. And then he says, therefore, there is no objective meaning. Follows from one and two, uh, given the truth of one and two. And then he says, there is subjective meaning, project which we embark on, ways in which we can make our lives meaningful, or if you will, act as if our life was meaningful in some sense. Um, and then he says, well, since there's no objective meaning from premises one to three, there is only subjective meaning. Uh, from which it follows, therefore, this is the conclusion that he draws, subjective meaning is constitutive of the meaning of life. Now, there seems to be a bit of a jump in the premises here between uh, five and six, we might wonder, well, okay, well, given that there's no objective meaning, why think that subjective meaning, since it exists, and we could, we could have that as a universal proposition, we could agree on that, why think that that's therefore constitutive of the meaning of life? Why not just be anti-realist with respect to meaning? So I think it's a deep question in, uh, a deep exegetical question that we need to wrestle with when we're thinking about Sartre's argument. Well, I mean, you might think, well, so what? Why not just, you know, why can't the projects that I embark on, the things that I do, or the things that I deem most meaningful to myself, why can't those, taken together, taken conjunctively, constitute the meaning of life? Well, I mean, why don't you just think that? So he has this really poetic expression. He says, in life, a man, of course he means, you know, human being, of course, women matter too, commits himself and draws on his own portrait, or sorry, and draws his own portrait, outside of which there is nothing. So basically what he seems to be saying here is, and he's going to you know, kind of explain this a little bit more, he's going to say, we are on a sphere of human beings. That's pretty much all that there is. So in life, we get thrown into the world, you know, this Heideggerian thrustness, and that's pretty much it, outside of which there's nothing. So you might think, so what? Well, Sartre doesn't very find this very pleasing. So consider, so there's some highlights that I'm going to, uh, there's some special parts of here that I want to emphasize, but basically we should go through this together. So he says, existentialists, on the other hand, find it extremely disturbing that God no longer exists, for along with his disappearance goes the possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. There could no longer be any upper or good, since there would be no infinite and perfect consciousness to conceive of it. Nowhere is it written that good exists, that we must be honest or must not lie. We are on a plane shared only by man. Dostoevsky once wrote, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. Sorry, everything is permissible. Um, and then if we keep going on, if, however, God does not exist, we will encounter no values or orders to legitimize our conduct. So an extension uh, from what Sartre has said here would be the idea that subjective meaning is basically all we're left with. But the legitimacy of subjective meaning seems to rest on something that, that ultimately has no justification. I mean, he seems to be making the assumption that, look, God doesn't exist, and what we're left with are these awful consequences. So what do we do? Well, in the void, we just kind of construct who we are, we construct meaning, we construct values, and that seems to be the sort of uh, thrust of his argument. Well, maybe we should reconsider the question as opposed to necessarily start to answer, although we can question it, as, as I have done. Well, why don't we shift the discussion from meaning to hope? Now, let me clarify this very quickly. What the, what the suggestion is from changing the term meaning to hope is not that questions of meaning are without significance, right? I mean, you want to be able to say without you know, this like logical positivist mentality of, well, that's cognitively meaningless, right? We want to be able to say, what is the meaning of life? And expect that to be itself a meaningful question. But the suggestion is maybe if we switch terms, maybe we can have some fruitful results. And we're going to attempt that. And of course, this is not something that I hold automatically. This is something that you know, I'm, I'm sharing because I'm really interested to see what you guys think about it. Um, and then the second suggestion is to reevaluate Sartre's argument under this new framework. So we can get into it right away. Well, what about this whole shift of you know meaning to hope? What's that about? Well, I mean, there's aforementioned problems of the term meaning. You know, there's many distinctions, misuse, ambiguity, and of course, since it's a term that we generally ask, in fact, the, the question of the, of the whole conference is what is the meaning of life? You know, what kind of perspectives can we give on it? One way of dealing with it might be to abandon the, the word meaning in the context of this question and ask a different question. Namely, what can we hope for? And eventually I'll point to an explicit reference of where this act is actually was attempted, historically speaking. So, I mean, and there's only one distinction to be made, hope from hopes, right? So, I mean, if you think about the concept of hope just in general, it's sort of something that lies beyond, you know, the scope of what we ourselves can achieve. So, for example, and this comes from uh, Joseph Pieper's uh, Hoffnung Geschichte, his Hope in History, he says, 
It might be the case that, you know, when we say, for example, uh, I, we hope for good weather, right? And what we're saying, in effect, is there, it's something that lies outside the scope of possibilities for me to achieve, right? Um, and in that sense, it's something that we hope. Now, things like hoping for good weather might be, you know, these sort of like momentary hopes that we all generally have. We hope for good weather, for example. But there might be a more fundamental hope, for example, hoping for a meaningful life, um, which might, in a sense, have, I don't know, this, um, hierarchically speaking, it might have a higher value than these, you know, these sort of momentary or finite hopes. Um, and thus, Kant's question, in my view, uh, most appropriately encapsulates the question of the meaning of life. And of course, this comes from the critique of pure reason, what may I hope? Um, and in this sense, I think by shifting the question a little bit, we might actually be able to get a more positive result or a little bit more clarity on what exactly we mean in general. But what is this thing of hope? Well, I mean, like any of Pieper's books, uh, we should know um, as a bit of a background, he resists any strict definition of like, pretty much anything. I mean, you know, this is the kind of the way you know, the legal, you know, legal terms work. You know, over time, we keep adding to our definitions. We keep making distinctions, you know, trying to take into consideration all the, the contexts in which we could be using the term, so as to provide a pretty good definition. But what we're doing essentially is what we're doing is we're taking the sort of the full amount of evidence that we have and trying to make a coherent definition, right? And that might involve thinking about some general characteristics, and that's what Pieper's doing. So here are some general character, uh, characteristics. Hope is something that can be encountered and grasped in our experience. Obviously, no need to keep hoping. Um, so it's a basic feature of our constitution, just like the pursuit of meaning. So you see a little bit of similarity there. We expect what we hope is good for us, um, and this might actually solve the, uh, the art, what I call the arbitrary problem of selecting what constitutes meaning in general, that it's gotta be something that's, that's good in some sense. Now we can debate what, what this good, what the content of this good is, the sort of meta-ethical question, but I think in general, we might actually have some progress here in the sense that you know, we can't just sort of arbitrarily pick what, pick what gives our life meaning, so it has to be something that is itself good. Um, so desire, longing, craving, wishes, hunger, and thirst must be involved, otherwise we are not talking about hope. So, I mean, the whole discussion of hope in general has to do with other basic features of the world as we find it. Um, we can't have this sort of isolated approach where we're not putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, and this definitely is a puzzle. It's, there's no hard, fast answer, I don't think, of always in philosophy, but um, if there's one way in which we can get at a pretty good answer, especially the question of the meaning of life, it's to take into consideration all the facts about human nature and about existence in general, ranging from you know philosophical anthropology into ontology, something like that. Well, could we hope for a meaningful life if in the end death is all there is? So here's one of the problems that people raises for start. Now again, not explicitly, but this is my extension of it. And again, this comes from, uh, I wrote the German title, but it's uh, Hope in History. What I'm stressing is this, a little bit of a title. No conception of a future state which simply ignores the fact of death, which leaves out of consideration the fact that men are destined for death, that their lives are a movement towards death. And there's a really nice imagery of like, sort of like, being like, a, like an arrow being shot, you know, and you're kind of, uh, sort of on there without you know, pretty much your will. And which likewise ignores all those who have already died. No such picture of the future can seriously claim to be an object of human hope. How can there be any talk of hope when the thing hoped for is so conceived that the being who alone, who alone is capable of hoping, namely the individual person, cannot have it? So he's stressing, I think, the idea that without the consideration of something beyond the grave, in some sense that's transfinite, that goes beyond mere finitude, you're going to have severe difficulties in actually being able to establish an objective meaning of existence. Consider, for example, a supplementary note from Jacques Martin, who, in one of his books, uh, Existence and the Existent, points out the following. And this is sort of descriptive of the, you know, uh, the Heideggerian you know, phenomenological perspective of human beings, uh, as well as Sartre's perspective. And listen to what he says, describing Sartre's view. This time it is the finite existence of subjects devoid of essence, whom a primordial atheistic option flings into the chaos of slimy and disaggregated appearances that make up a radically irrational world, and who it summons to make or create, not of course their essence or their intelligible structure, since those do not exist, but images launched into time, projects which fail again and again to furnish them with something like a compass. So what he's pointing out here is that the picture that Sartre's really drawing 
He's pointing out that if you adopt the premises that Sartre actually ascribes to, the idea that there is no God, that there is no such thing as the sort of transcendental realm of values, what actually happens eventually is that you don't get these mere you know, creatures who kind of make their essence as they go along, but you get what he puts it as slimy and disaggregated appearances. You don't get much more, you don't get almost any value that's derivative from you know, searching for the meaning of life, you know, in the sense of making meaning for your life, if there is no realm of transcendental uh, meaning or value. Okay, so what was Sartre's mistake, says Peter. Well, subjective meaning can constitute the meaning of life. That's the claim. And the problem is twofold. It cannot be the proper object of hope, since it's predicated on a false philosophical anthropology and is positively false. Now, these are two points which I did not defend, but these are just two things to consider. Um, subjective meaning cannot be the ultimate object of hope, since it leaves out the fact of death. That's the, pretty much the crux of the shift from meaning to hope. Um, and then the second claim is that there is no objective meaning. Um, and of course, this is what's called in logic a subjunctive condition, which sort of presupposes P and then what follows is Q. In the case of Sartre, he sort of presupposes P in general and then sees what follows. So in that sense, uh, the big problem is this rests on a huge subjunctive condition. Uh, it rests on the assumption that God does not exist, and Sartre ultimately admits this in existentialism and humanism. Uh, is that true? I've defended otherwise. And contemporary philosophers of religion have defended otherwise. Not that this is an appeal to authority argument, but only in the sense that the, re the rational credibility of such a claim uh, is by no means um, uh, not up for discussion. It's definitely up for discussion. Well, what things can we conclude? Well, I mean, sorry to answer the Kant's question is inadequate. A meaningful life can only be hoped for if what guarantees meaning is transfinite. That is, it goes beyond that. Now, the deeper question as to what could then constitute hope in the strong sense is now for debate. Consider our final word from the brief Pascal. He says, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there, the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can only be filled with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Thank you very much. I know I saw your face the whole time. I was like, he's going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so can you go back to the previous? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or, uh, or the one before it. Um, so where? Yeah, here, right? Yeah, tell me. Uh, so why is, why do you think, um, Hope must necessarily uh, take into account uh, death, and why isn't it possible to have some sort of hope for our life that would be meaningful and fulfilling without the prospect of the afterlife, just to find some sort of, yeah, construct our own meaning here without. So, why your question is, so for those who didn't hear it, anything, so why take death into consideration at all, and why not just make the ultimate object of hope a meaningful life here? Yeah. Okay, so I have a response to that. Um, and of course, the way in which I presented the, the way in which I, thank you for your question, by the way, but um, the way in which I constructed the presentation was only to offer a sort of conjecture as the shift from meaning to hope. Mm -hmm. But the question that you're raising goes a little bit beyond the scope, I think, of what I talked about, but I'll answer it nonetheless. Um, the reason I would say, for example, that death has to be taken into consideration, and this might actually require supplementary premises, which I'll, I'll give now, um, one of which is, um, there's a good argument, I think, which says that if God does not exist, then the only meaning which is left is subjective meaning, right? The meaning that you can kind of create for yourself. The problem is, once you take that out of the, once you take that into account, once you say that all these things are, you know, they're, they're sort of the subjective things that we do, um, the problem is that it's very difficult to see how any kind of subjective meaning could in the end, or ultimately speaking, actually matter. So for example, one person, I mean, if you take Dostoevsky's quote, for example, that Sartre quote is, if God is dead, all things are permitted, right? Um, and even actually Nietzsche points this out in the gay science he, when he's describing the death of God. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, that Nietzsche would necessarily agree with me. One thing that he pointed out was, he says, you know, are we not just going through an infinite nothing, right? I mean, the question would then be, <coughs> in this sense, what would subjective meaning be in the infinite void? 
So your comment actually rests on other presuppositions, which of course, oh, exactly. philosophy of course. Um, but I would, I would actually say a couple things. So first of all, um, the, the first question is as to the legitimacy of building such a kingdom, right? Um, as I said, I, I think that there are good premises which I think that we should adopt, which suggests that any kind of endeavor to make the kingdom of God, so to speak, I think uh, Una Muno, if I'm pronouncing her name right, has a, has a paper on this. It's collected in um, the basic writing that, writings of existentialism by Gordon Marino. Um, and he kind of says, you know, why can't we just sort of build the kingdom of God ourselves, right? And, I, and the question is, well, I mean, what would be the, the, the philosophical legitimacy of such a project? And what that amounts to saying sort of is, let's just sort of pretend like in the end things matter, when as a matter of fact, they don't, right? Um, now, one more thing that I, that I might add is, um, if you take away also the equation of, of, uh, of the existence of God, for example, um, you also take away the realm of, uh, in my view, values, but you also, of course, naturally enough, you get rid of the idea of um, the uh, reward for good doing and, of course, the bad for wrong doings. Um, and a nice supplementary uh, note to this would be from uh, Richard Wombrand, um, who was tortured for his faith in communist prisons, and he says the following. He says, quote, the cruelty of atheism is hard to believe when man has no faith in the reward of good or the punishment of evil. There is no reason to be human. There is no restraint from the depths of evil which is man. The communist torturers often said, there is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. I have heard one torturer even say, I thank God, in whom I don't believe, that I have lived to this hour when I can express all the evil in my heart. He expressed it in unbelievable brutality and torture inflicted on prisoners. And I don't think that this is an argument from emotion, for example. I think it appeals to our general intuition about you know, the nature of good, that it can't be grounded in, in necessarily how we feel, but that this must actually, if it's to be philosophically legitimate, grounded in something transcendental. I appreciate the, uh, you know, the need, I mean, not the need, but rather the, the the necessity for considering uh, the transcendent as a foundation for mm -hmm. uh, a good life or a meaningful life. Um, but I'm a bit skeptical mm -hmm. uh, about mm -hmm. it, and the reason why is because pain, the reality of pain mm -hmm. and suffering, uh, actually I think that is the ultimate that provides the foundation itself. Right. So the fact that, I mean, human beings can be in pain or can experience suffering regardless of whatever metaphysics turns out to be true, right? Regardless of whether there is a God or not. So are you saying that suffering is possible given just any kind of... Suffering is possible okay. no matter what. So okay. it seems to be part of the fabric Right, and if that is true, regardless of there, if, whether there is a God or there isn't, a God, right. um, negating that suffering through acts of you know conscious acts right. and using reason right. and using the you know uh, social human interaction and virtues and um, that's part of how you construct. Why isn't that mm -hmm. reality, the, the reality of pain, right. and the desire to negate it mm -hmm. and overcome it, right. sufficient right. to construct, right. or to get away from that void and chaos and evil? Right. Right. Um, so there's a few things. I mean, for one, there's, there's many premises of your argument. So one of them would be, I mean, you say, for example, why can't we just use reason right, as a, a sort of instrument? Not just, not just reason. But well, there's other things, but you're yeah. saying that ultimately, but I mean, ultimately, though, I mean, you would have to be a rational creature to realize that maybe, by the way, I should help suffering creatures, right? That would, that would be a necessary, not sufficient condition, would you agree with me? Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, there's a couple things to be said. One, um, just because reason dictates that you should do something doesn't mean that it's necessarily, like, uh, it, I mean, this, this all comes back to your basic ontology, but I don't think that it's a fact of, uh, of every metaphysical portrait of reality that suffering is going to be involved. I mean, for one thing, our experience of suffering, first and foremost, is based on a biological constitution in which we can actually have, you know, experience of suffering. There's mental, sure, there's, like a, there's a mental side to it. There's also a biological side. So I, I don't know if it's built into the fabric of being itself that presupposes also what being is, right? And, you know, it's hard to point it out. It's very difficult.
know, it's a picture of. Um, but I think the other thing is when you say, for example, that why don't we just help other creatures as to make meaning for our lives, you're also presupposing that human beings have intrinsic moral worth, right? And that requires justification because, again, there's a good argument which says, independent of any kind of you know, transcendent foundation for such a claim, uh, ultimately it, what you're left with is social conditioning and, and speciesism, right? So that, that might be a way in which you respond. But of course, we can talk about this after. Sure. But I appreciate your comment.